Today we're going to discuss there are four sons in the Haggadah. Which one am I? Which one am I? Hmm. It's interesting that uh, in the Manishtana, you can't ask the same four questions every year. You have to diversify. So I'll give you a couple of questions that are not on the book because you can't bore the people every year with the same questions. Ma nishtana Pesach mikol chagim that Pesach is the only Chag where you say Hallel also at night. Right, Gershom? Ma nishtana Pesach mishara chagim that I say Hallel gambalayla. What about Sukkot? What about uh, Hanukkah? What about uh, Shavuot? What am I, chopped liver? You don't say the whole Hallel during those days. What? Well, why do you say Hallel? The only young tip where you say Hallel at night also is what? Is Pesach. No other Chag. That's a Manishtana question. So to answer this question, we also have to what? Ask another question. We do, to answer this question, we ask another. We do something very strange on Seder night. We interrupt the Hallel with manja manja. Think about it. You say the first two parochim in Hallel, all of a sudden, Shalom, what do you do? You stop and you what? Eat. And then you go back and say Hallel. Isn't that weird? You interrupt the Hallel, praising God, in the middle, you hakarai with a suda. Is that proper decorum? No. Mm -hmm. Yes! But the question is, why? To answer this question, we're going to ask another question. Hope you're getting this down, David. You can't ask the same, you can't ask the same questions every year. When was the first time a human being was commanded to eat the korban? Now keep in mind, Cain and Hevel brought korbanot. The Torah says so. Noah brought korbanot. Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov brought korbanot. Would they ever dare to eat the karban? Sacrilege. Karban, all the karbanot that Noah, Cain, Hevel, Avon, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, they all brought karban olot. The animals totally consumed on the altar. Who would think of eating a karban? It's sacrilege. The first time in Jewish history that a human being was commanded to eat the karban was the karban Pesach. It was a revolution. That was the original spring revolution, Middle East revolution. God commanded us to eat a karban, which was unheard of up until that time. Would Abraham dream of eating a karban? Never. Would Noah? What are you talking about? It's all for God. There was a game changer on Pesach night, buddy, the original Middle East revolution, where God says, this karban, you're going to eat it. And all of it, except the fat, the blood, and the kishkis, okay? And therefore, on Pesach night, God commanded to smear the blood of the carbon Pesach on the doorpost and on the what? The sides of the door. Why did, now, you know, the book is better than the movie. In the movie, you have them smearing the blood where? Outside of the house. But that's not so. God says, we know where you live. It was smeared on the inside of the house. It says, Dam lechem laot. Lechem. So you can't trust the movie. The book is better. They smeared the blood on the inside of the house. But that, that begs the question, buddy. Why? God knows where we live. Why get your wallpaper dirty? Oh, you're leaving the next morning. Right? You're leaving the next morning. You smear up all the walls of your Cairo apartment. Right? But what's the message? Why smear the walls? The answer is, what do you normally do with a karban? With a karban, the animal is burned on the altar and the blood is smeared on the walls of the Mizbeach. On Pesach night, please. On Pesach night, God said there's a game changer. Instead of burning the carbon on the altar that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did, and what did they do with the blood? 
they smeared on the walls of the Mizbeach. Tonight, tonight, Gershom, it won't be like any night. Tonight, instead of burning the carbon, you're going to eat it. Instead of smearing the blood on the walls of the Mizbeach, you're going to smear the blood on your house. What is God saying? Tonight, you and your house are becoming a living, breathing Mizbeach. Isn't that a game changer? Instead of burning the carbon and smearing the blood on the Mizbeach, you, by eating the carbon, you are becoming a living, breathing Mizbeach. And your home will become a Mizbeach. So therefore you smear the blood on the house and you eat the carbon. Pesach night, God created a holy people where a Jew can become, if he wants, him and his house can become a living Mizbeach. Therefore, we wear a kittel on Seder night. The big day kuhuna, the most prominent of the begodim that the Kohen wore, Rabbi Yaakov, was a long white robe. On Pesach night, all of us are becoming, remember that show Queen for a Day? I'm dating myself. This is Kohen for a night. All of us are becoming a Kohen for a night. Our Seder is becoming a virtual avodah. Me and my home on Seder night are becoming a living, breathing Mizbeach. So therefore I eat the Korban. My mouth and my stomach become a Mizbeach. Wow. That concept was created when? Seder night. Therefore we do something strange. In the middle of the Hallel, we eat. Is that an interruption? No. no. When a Jew eats L'Shem Shemayim, the eating itself is no interruption. The eating is part of the Hallel. When a Jew eats because God says, I want you to eat and, and enjoy that shawarma tonight, then that eating is no interruption. That becomes part of the Hallel. Wow. When a Jew does even physical acts, if he does it L'Shem Shemayim, that becomes part of Hallel as well. So we say Hallel on Pesach night, the night when we became a holy special people, the night where God turned us and our homes into a living, breathing Mizbeach, that night deserves a Hallel. And therefore we eat in the middle of Hallel to prove, Michael, that when a Jew eats L'Shem Shemayim, even in the middle of Hallel, there's no interruption. A Jew's eating can become part of Hallel, just like a Jew himself can become a living, breathing Mizbeach. And therefore, Pesach is the exception where we say Hallel even on Pesach night, because that night was a game changer. The original Middle East Revolution where God turned a human being and his home into a living Mizbeach. Now, <clears throat> Let's to the, the force, which son am I, right? Which son am I? Interesting, right? Now, the Torah says, The word Haggadah is taken from the Shabbos reading that we read surely yesterday, Pashas HaKodesh. It's a mitzvah in Torah. So the question is, why does the Rambam change the language? Mitzvah l'saper b'tiyas Mitzrayim. He should have said mitzvah l'hagid. And the Haggadah also says, Mitzvah aleinu l'saper b'tiyas Mitzrayim. B'chol amar saper. Again, the word sipur, the Rambam and the Haggadah should have st stuck to the text. Mitzvah l'hagid. The Torah says, V'higad ato l'bincha, you shall tell over your son, the word Haggadah means to tell over. Why does the Haggadah change the text instead of Lahagid mitzvah l'saper? V'chol amar saper. So the Zoyar explains that the word l'saper comes from the word sapir. We all shine on. When a Jew speaks about the Exodus on Pesach night, his neshama shines like a sapir. Here it is, Michael. 
Therefore, the Haggadah doesn't say mitzvah lahagid, which it should say, Vikar al bincha. Mitzvah le saper. Vikhala marbe le saper. Bitsiyas min shayim. Because the Zohar explains that anyone who talks about the Exodus on Pesach night, his neshama shines like a sapir. And that's the same word as the word uh, the sapir. Our neshama shines. Shine them up. And therefore we keep saying the word the sapir and not the higarata as the, uh, the Torah says. <clears throat> now, it's interesting that the four sons of the Haggadah are introduced by Baruch HaMakayim, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shanatan Torah Yisrael, Baruch Hu. Why is the four sons introduced by a paragraph that mentions the word Baruch how many times? Four times. Kawinki Dinki. Interesting. In the Pasha that we read yesterday, Pasha Sakhodesh, the Torah quotes the Russia. Ma voida zoislochem. You old fuddy duddy, what is this service to you? Hey, get with it. Ma voida zoislochem. Right? And the Torah doesn't give the answer that the Haggadah gives. Knock out his teeth. I'm not a dentist. The Torah says, the Amartem Zevach Pesach Lashem. You explain to him what it's all about. And then it says, Yesterday's reading. The people bowed and praised God. On what? Says Rashi. Al Basura Tabanim. Because they heard they're going to have kids. The kids will say, So Rashi in Exodus 12 says, Why did they thank and praise God? But Sharada, which son says, Which son says, It's the Russia. So what does Rashi say? They were thanking God. Which banim were they thanking God for? Strange. The one who says, That's the Rasha. What does Rashi mean? They're thanking God even for the Ben Rasha? Why? What? Beautiful, Muhammad. At least he showed up. But interesting that the paragraph that introduces the four sons, we say, Baruch HaMokoyim Baruch Hu, Baruch Shanatan Torah Baruch Hu. The paragraph that introduces that the four sons mentions the word Baruch four times to teach that what? That every child is a blessing. Even a wicked child. Say what, Michael? Even the Rasha is a blessing. Rashi and Chumash, yesterday's reading. They praised and thanked God. Rashi says, Besurat habanim, but Ezeb ben, the one who says, Ma'avay da zois lechem. Lechem, to you, but I don't want to be involved in it. And yet Rashi said they praise God. Interesting, they praise God even for the Rasha. And we say, Baruch HaMokoyim four times. We introduce, mind if I open the window a little bit? No, no, go ahead. I don't, I don't want to fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? You ever went to a lecture where the speaker fell asleep? <laughs> I don't want to put myself to sleep. But uh, Baruch HaMokram introduced four times that every child is what? A blessing. The question is, why? Hmm? Keneget Arba Bonim Divrei Torah. The Torah speaks for four children. Echad Chacham, the Echad Rasha, the Echad Tam, the Echad Shein De Elisho. Each one it says Echad. It should have said Echad Chacham, Vasheni Rasha, Vashlishi Tam, Varivi. Doesn't say that. It says Echad Chacham, the Echad Rasha, the Echad Tam. Each one it says the word what? Echad. Each person is unique and individual. Every person, there are no two people that are alike. The Talmud says, just like our fingerprints and our noses are different, all of our personalities are different. Each person is an echad. He's unique. 
and you can't compare any person to somebody else. So it's echad chacham, not a sheni rasha, echad rasha, echad tam, etc. Now you would think that when you, when you think of rasha, what's the opposite of a rasha? Sadiq. So it should have said echad sadiq ve echad rasha. It doesn't say that. It says echad chacham ve echad rasha. The way we think, you know, we say tzaddik. What's the opposite? Rasha. 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 So how come it's chacham? It's not tzaddik. It's chacham, and the opposite is a rasha. So the question is why? So uh, what am I telling me? Don't answer the question today. Devorah, are you here? Devorah, you gave a great answer. Because our, what? Ah. Uh, Devorah gave a great answer. Not Sadiq. You know why he's a Rasha? Because he's not a Chacham. Oh, surely. He never didn't learn. He's a Tinik Shanishba. He was educated by Israel TV. What? Right. But he's a Rasha because he's not a Chacham. He doesn't know better. If he knew better, if it be a Chacham, he would not be a Rasha. I like that. Right? Malam Eitzchus, buddy. Why is he a, a Rasha? Because he's not a Chacham. If he knew the beauty of Judaism, would he go to the Guru? Would he run to India to the Maharishi Heshi Yogi? Huh? Heshi. You know Heshi. Right? You know the story. There was this great Guru, Maharishi Heshi Yogi, and he needed a six months appointment to go to him. Right? So this woman, this elderly woman, went to him without an appointment. Right? They wouldn't let her in. She said, I have to see the Marishi Heshi Yogi. Lady, you don't have an appointment. She's standing outside his palace. You can't go in. You haven't got an appointment. So she yells in, Sheldon, it's time to come home. <laughs> don't you get it? <laughs> Sheldon, it's time to come home. It's okay. Just, right now, but I want to. Yeah. Makom is not the normal term for that. Right. In Kailas, it says the kom, the same word. In koma mishpat sham aresha. No chon. Koma tzedek sham aresha. No chon. But I want to. S- and then it fell. What it means is you could have. That's why she used the term makom. Right. I, I but I want to say, it's melame tzchus. That the person's a rasha because never he, he's not a chacham. If he knew the beauty and the wisdom of Judaism, Kani, he wouldn't be a rasha. He's never ignorant. He thinks the answer is found somewhere in India or uh, wherever. Okay? Right. So how come we say Baruch even for the rasha? Four times. Rashi at the end of Pasha's bow makes an incredible statement. Rashi says that the four sections of the Tvilin, Rashi at the end of Pasha's bow, says that the four sections of the Tvilin, Ephraim, represent four the four sons. That even the Rasha is represented by what? A Pasha and the Tvilin, no less. That's what Rashi says. Ooh, wee. Mmm. Even a Russia deserves one of the sections of the tefillin. Why? The answer is because today's Rasha, next year or next day, could be a great tzaddik. Just because he's a Russia today, Rabbi Yaakov, doesn't mean he be a Russia tomorrow. Look at the great Rabbi Akiva, the great Mishlokish. One of the greatest Samarayim, what were they? In their early lives. Moshe Rabbeinu himself, the prince of Egypt. What do you think he learned there in the Cairo University? Moses. Huh? And Yisrael, there wasn't one of all the Zari he didn't worship. Yisrael, what? All of the greatest. Where did they start their careers? Huh? Avraham Avinu, says the Rambam, was an idol worshiper until he acknowledged 
So today's, today's Rasha, who's tomorrow's Tzadik. So therefore, you have to thank God even for the Rasha. Because he's not going to, if he gets Chachma, he won't be a Rosh anymore. If he learns the beauty, the beauty of Jewish wisdom, he will not be a Rasha. The problem is he's not a Chacham yet. There's an amazing Gemara in Kresus. Kretut. There's 11 herbs and spices. That's for the colonel, the KFC. I think the colonel was Jewish. He has a white beard, wasn't he? And he wore a white. The colonel, right? Colonel. There's 11 herbs and spices. That's what the Ketoret was, 11 herbs and spices. You think KFC got it from there? I don't know. All of them smell delicious except the Chelbana. The Chelbana smelled very foul and disgusting. So Talmud Kriso says that the Chelbana represents the Rishayim. One minute, one minute. The Torah surely is the highest service to God. If the Chelbana was missing, the entire service is Pasul. The Kohen is Chayiv Mita. But the Chelbana, the foul smelling, represents the Rasha. We need him too. If he's not part of the mix, you can't make the Torah. You can't even daven. If there's not a Russia present, strange Gemara, you can't even daven unless there's a Russia there. We learn from the Chelbana, the foul smelling, uh, all the ten smell delicious, one smell disgusting, representing the Rishayim, but if he's not there, your service, your avoda is possible. That's right. The call is Chai Misa B'day Shemayim. So we need every Jew. Because today's Rasha very easily becomes tomorrow's Tzadik and Chacham. Give him a chance. Yes, you had a question, Shirley. How do you play a person like Maya Lansky? Yeah. Who was a murderer. No, he never killed anybody. He was good to his mother, though. He was good to his mother. Oh, you ever read that book? I was good to his mother. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? Yeah. That's right. Everybody surely has a verot and mitzvot. Every per yo word is murder. Word is one of the, the worst sins. Okay. That's one of the worst sins, so for that to be punished. But for the good that he did, he's going to be rewarded. A mitzvah and a vera do not cancel each other out. Right? For every mitzvah we do, we'll get a reward. Every vera do, we get punished. Unless you do tshuva. But how do you do tshuva for murder? That's, how do you do tshuva for murder? Are you support the wife and orphans? You could do that. Right? Right? If you're in jail, you can't support the wife and orphans, okay? Mm -hmm. But anyway, which of the four sons am I? The four sons represent the inner struggle within each and every one of us. My Reverend Palm Zatal said, every one of us, if he's honest with himself, is a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. Hyde. And if you don't believe that, my rabbi said, you don't know yourself. The four sons represent the inner struggle within each and every one of us, Shalom. Sometimes we act like a chacham. Sometimes we lose it. And we carry on like a rasha. Talking about myself. Other times, I act like a tam. I'm just you know, dumbfounded. And other times, Shani Day Elisho, I just don't know what to say or when to say. Every one of us during our lives are all four of these four sons, if you know yourself. All of us have moments when we just don't know what to say or even whom to ask. So what's our tafkid on Seder night? We have to target those areas of our personality that needs improvement. You have to accent the positive and try, accent, oh. Accent. 
accentuate. Oh, we have to accentuate. It sounds. You have to accentuate the positive and try to eliminate the negative. Mm. That's what the Seder night is all about. We have to set the tone to try to uh, eliminate the Russia in us or at least diminish him and to build up the Chacham. It's, all of us are all four simultaneously. That's incredible. That's who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. Mm. So, wow. So that's all of us. There are Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And we have to work on building up the Chacham and trying to diminish the Rasha and the Tam and Shere De Elishal. And not to be ashamed to say, I don't know. Rashi, the greatest Bible commentator, Rashi stands for Rabban Shel Yisrael, the greatest teacher of Israel besides Moses. Even when the Ramban argues with him, he says, Velo mishpat Besides Moses, who's the greatest teacher in Israel? Rashi. 72 times, you can count it if you can believe me, 72 times throughout his parish in Talmud and Tanakh, he says, Ani lo yodeya. 72 times. He says, Ani lo yodeya. Wow. So, not to be ashamed that we don't know. So, 72 times he says, I don't know. Many times, surely Rashi doesn't comment. He could have just skipped it. Why do you have to say, Ani lo yodeya? Rashi will only comment when something bothers him. Many times in Tanakh and Talmud he doesn't comment because nothing's bothering him. So just skip it for weiter. No. If he would skip it, Mr. Heinowitz, he would say, people would think it didn't bother him. He was too honest for that. It bothers me and I don't know the answer. Help me. Or he's teaching a great lesson. Don't be ashamed to say, Moshe, I don't know. That's a powerful lesson. If Rashi would skip it, I wouldn't learn the lesson not to be ashamed that I don't know. So Rashi is teaching me a powerful lesson. Don't be ashamed to say I don't know. That's also an important lesson. And therefore Rashi 72 times, no less, will say Ani lo yadeya. Pretty interesting. So the Chacham, he says, Mo edus fachukim va mishpatim. The mitzvahs are divided between edot, chukim, and mishpatim. Chukim are laws between what? Man and man? No, I'm testing to see if you're awake. I'm seeing if you're awake. Chukim are between man and God. Mishpatim are between what? Man and man, right? So he says, what's it all about? That's what he said, what's it all about? Why all these chukim, mishpatim, laws between man, laws between God? So what do you tell him? What do you tell him? Ein maftirin achara pesach afikomen. From all the thousands of laws in the Torah, Sharona. I mean, I would have talked to him about Shabbos. I would have told him Hilchas Nida. I would have told him Shatnis. No, you tell him a rabbinic law. A law that after you eat the carbon pesach, no jello tonight. Gershon, that's what you tell him. Right? No, that on pesach night, after you have the shawarma, I mean the carbon Pesach, you're not allowed to eat anything else. That's Judaism. I mean, that's all the rabbinic mitzvah. Why not tell him thousands of other Torah laws? Why are you telling him, Ein maftir and achra Pesach afikoman? That after you eat the carbon Pesach, you're not allowed to have dessert. Afikoman is afikuman. Afikoman is Aramaic word. Afikuman, bring out the jello. Bring out the dessert, okay? So no dessert on Pesach night. So that, that's what, he asked me, what's it all about? All the mitzvot. That's what it is, Jude, that's Judaism, Rabbi Yaakov. What's the message? This is Judaism. Judaism is discipline, self-control. I just had a nice shawarma. I want something sweet to end the night. Some parava ice cream? Lillian, no. No. 
Judaism is all about what? No power of ice cream. No, it's not the power of ice cream. Self-control, discipline. Accept limitations. God is in charge. You have to limit and restrict yourself. That's Judaism. Think of it. I like to have the cheeseburger. I like to have the pig. I like to be with my wife when she didn't go to the mikveh yet. I have urges. Control yourself. What it means to be a loyal Jew is accept God's limitations on you. Discipline yourself. Be a savlan, self-control. And that's all about Judaism. And that's why we tell him that halacha, which sums up Yehadut. As the Mishnah says, Eze gibor, hakovish is Yitzhak. Who's a gibor? Charlie Atlas? Hakovish is Yitzro. Someone's able to what? Control himself. I want to have that jello, that pie of ice cream. Or I like to taste a cheeseburger to say it's delicious. Right? A kovesh es yitzro. Right? Self control. That's a gibor. We shall overcome. Moshe. That's Judaism. They got that from us too. Right? Right. Now you think about it. The first mitzvah given to a human being was don't eat that tray for tree. Right. Remember? Yes. For Adam and Chava, that tree was the tray for. Connie, it's amazing. Dif discipline, self-control. You have an urge to eat that tree? God says, I'm in charge. C learn to control yourself. Not to give in to your urges, because then you're no different than a behemoth. That's what it means to be what? A mensch. Not, not even a Jew. Keep the seven, go to heaven. Control yourself. Limit yourself. Discipline yourself. Except and then you're a mensch. Exactly. Uh, I want to eat before davening. I have an urge to eat before davening. No, you can't. Not allowed to. It says, Loi tochlu al adam. Don't eat before you pray for your blood. The person is sick, it's another story. But a healthy person is not allowed to eat before he prays for his blood. Again, discipline, self-control, limitations, that's what Judaism is all about. Wow. To restrict oneself, to limit oneself. But why is that so important to God? Yeres of Yaakov, why is that so important to God? That's Judaism in a nutshell, right? To control and limit yourself. So why is that the crux of the issue? Fasten your seatbelts. There's a mitzvah in the Torah, v'halachta bedrachav. Buddy, what does that mean? Mahu afata. Emulate God, right? There's a mitzvah in Deuteronomy, it's repeated a few times, to walk in his ways. Mahu afata. Followed his footsteps. How did God create the world, Nechama? All the Kabbalists say, Tzimtzum. God restricted and limited himself. Otherwise, there wouldn't be room for a molecule or an amoeba. How could anything exist, Rabbi Yaakov? It's, everything is God. How could anything exist besides him? So all the Kabbalists say, surely God practiced Tzimtzum. Kaviochel, he limited, he controlled himself, he restricted himself, otherwise there couldn't be a universe. There couldn't be a human being, couldn't be anything, let alone a human being. So God practiced limitation and self-control in order to create the universe. God restricts and limits himself. So God says, follow the leader. That's Judaism. Limit and control yourself. Limit yourself. I did it to create you. The tough kid of a human being is what? Moshe, to walk in God's ways. So that's Judaism. Ooh. Kovish Yitzho, you limit, you control yourself. That is Judaism. That is acting godlike. Otherwise, God could never create the universe. Pretty interesting, huh? Now, 
The Haggadah says something incredible. If I wouldn't hear it from Rapam, I wouldn't say it over. So what he, the Haggadah says that the Russia, right? You old fuddy duddy, what are you practicing? It's outdated, get with it, right? So what are you supposed to say to him? Af ata haket shinav. Now the English says, uh, you should what? What does the English say? Haket shinav. It says you should blunt his teeth. Connie, I'm not a dentist. You know one? I know a good one. Uh, what haket shinav mean? So Rapam said, I, I'm not a dentist. He says it's totally wrong shot that we were taught as a kid. Haket Shinov doesn't mean sharpen his teeth, blunt his teeth, or kick out his teeth. That's how you talk to someone at the Seder. Haket Shinov said, my Rebbe, sharpen his shins. The word haket means to sharpen. Sharpen his shins. Say what? The letter shin. You ever notice on your Trivon Shorosh, there's a four-headed shin. Isn't there a four-headed chin? Why is there a four-headed chin? It represents the four mothers of Israel. Shin represents Shaddai, the Almighty. Why four heads? The whole mess of, of the Exodus happened because Noshim Tzidkaniyos, right? Everything on the Seder night surely revolves around what? Four. There are four questions. There are four cups. Please, please, Michael. There are four questions. There are four cups. There are four terms of endearment. What's the four? So the Talmud says the four represents the four mothers of Israel. The Talmud in Sota says that the whole exodus happened, Noshim Tzitkaniot. Not for the chief rabbis, the righteous women. Who represents Rabbi Yaakov, the righteous women? The four mothers of Israel. So the whole Seder motif is four. Representing giving honor to the four mothers of Israel who represent what? The righteous women? Please. The four shins, the four headed shin, my Rebbe said, represents the four mothers of Israel. Our connection to Shaddai is through not the three fathers, it's the four mothers. Your father could be the Vilna Gon. Does that make you Jewish, Shirley? No, no. Your father could be Moshe Rabbeinu. No. Does that make you Jewish? No. Your father could be loyal to a Puerto Rican. If your mother is Jewish, Jewish. Jewish. Hmm? <laughs> doesn't matter. The papa, the papa. It depends on the mama, the mama. <laughs> Our connection to Shaddai, the Shin, is because of the four mamas. The mamas, the mamas. Whether you're Jewish or not doesn't depend on the pop at all. Moshe Rabbeinu, Bin Lagan, no. The mama, the Jewish soul is routed through the mother. Because women are more godlike, women are more spiritual. The word Nishama, the word Shechina, the word Torah, the word Mitzvah are all feminine. Haket Shinav. We are going to Pesach night, we tell the Rasha, you're not as wicked as you think you are. You're Haket Shinav. We are going to sharpen your connection to Shaddai that comes through the four headed chin, which represents what? The four mothers of Israel. No matter how far you strayed, Pesach night, you get rerouted, reconnected to your roots. What are your roots? The four-headed chin, the four mothers of Israel. That's your connection to Shaddai. You're still connected. You can never cut your roots as long as you come from the four mothers of Israel. So Pesach night, haket shinav. You tell the Rashi you're not as evil as you think. You're still connected. It's a time to sharpen his connections, Shinab, from the word letter Shin. Wow, pretty interesting, right? 
The schus avot. The schus avot. On one minute, right? Now, what do we tell the Russia? Iluhoy yasham, lohoy nigal. That's how you talk to a kid at the Seder. Nye, 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 nye. If you were there, you wouldn't be redeemed. Rabbi Yaakov, that's how you talk. A, a son is sitting at the Seder. And you say, if, if you were there, you wouldn't be redeemed. So my rabbi said, let's. Iluhoy yasham, lohoy nigal. If you were there before Kabbalah Satira, you wouldn't be redeemed. But thank God you're not Sham, you're Po. Over there, over here. If you were there in Mitzrayim, you didn't have the lifesaver called what? The Torah. So never you would have been lost. But Ilu, thank God you're not Sham, said my Rebbe. You're Po. Now we have the Torah. No matter how disconnected you are, you're still connected. Through the mothers of Israel, because you have the Torah. But you're not Sham, you're Po. Through the Torah, you can always what? Return. Wow. But they lived in Mitzrayim. Make up us a Torah. So they didn't have that life savior that we call the Torah. Thank God that we do. And this is what we're telling the Russia. Thank God you're not Sham. Where are you? Po. You're Po. Wow. Pretty interesting, huh? Wow. So all of these years we thought we have to go to dental school, but that's not the answer, no? Haketchinav, no? Interesting, right? Mm -hmm. It's amazing that Parshis Achre Mot always falls Avraham Berkowitz. Pesach. Pasha's Achremot. That's next, not this week, next week's Pasha. Always falls around Pesach time. In Pasha's Achremot, there's a Pasuk, Hashochen Itam Betoch Tomotam. God dwells amongst them, Betoch Tomotam, in the middle of their defilement. Says Rashi, Afa Pi Shehem Temeim, Shechina Beinehem. This is the answer to the Russia. No matter how defiled you think you are, Shechina, Bnei, the Shechina is always with you. So Pasha's Achrei Mos, always around Pesach time, that even when a person is defiled, says Rashi, Afa Pishahim Temeim, Shechina Beneihem. The Shechina remains amongst us because we have the Torah, which they didn't have. That's why 80% didn't make it, Avram. They didn't have the lifesaver called the Torah. Thank God we do. So the Shekhinah is always amongst us. So this is what we're telling the Rasha. It's never too late. Just shine up your shins. Right? Pretty interesting, right? You always have the schut, the schut of the four mothers. Right? Shine up your shins, right? Mm. Right, right. Now, Lubavitcher Rebbe says something amazing. Why by the fifth cup do we open the door? Eliyah, please, Eliyah Novi can go through the chimney. He doesn't need to go through a front door. Right, Nikimia? He can go through the chimney. The right. Babaji Rebbe said, you open the door for the fifth cup. Who is the fifth cup? The fifth son. Who doesn't even bother showing up. Even for him, you open the door. Because Elijah can go through the chimney. Hmm. Baba Terebi said that. The one who doesn't even show up, we open the door and welcome him in as well. Yes? If your theory is that the four mothers... It's not my theory. It's my Rebbe from Rabbi Palms. I'm saying it's of Racha. That's I'm just saying over what he told why, us. Why is this the holiday that is the most difficult for mothers? Ah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what? That's a great question, huh? That's why it's Mother's Day after that. What? That's a really a great question, what? Because why What? They do all Because they work all so what? They work so hard, right? Right? Mm hmm? What? Mm hmm? Mm hmm?
That's a great question. Yeah, that's really a good question. So what's the answer? What's the answer? I think Lubavitcher Rebbe was asked that, that question. Mm -hmm. He said that the whole Torah depends on what? Shalom Bayit, he said. Shalom Bayit. For Shalom Bayit, Hashem said, erase my name for Shalom Bayit. But it's Ota. The Lubavitcher Rebbe addressed your question. He says that not just on, on the Pesach, but if a husband is not helping his wife with the housework constantly, then he's responsible that Shalom, that there's no Shalom in the house. He's responsible. Because husbands don't help their wives enough. The Lavitch Rebbe said Judaism teaches charity, Abraham, you know that, Be begins, at begins at home. Helping your wife, that's doing Shalom bias. There was a fa the, there's a famous story this big learner in B'nai Brak from the Panovich Yeshiva got married. Big learner. He hit his Mickey. Big learner. Big learner. Big masmid. He got married. And a few weeks after the wedding, the wife came to his Rosh Yeshiva and said that, uh, my husband, I can't take it anymore. I asked him to help him with the dishes, take out the garbage, do the shopping. I can't. I'm learning. I can't be mafzik my learning. I can't. Whatever I ask him to do, house chores, he says, I can't, I'm too busy learning. So the Rosh Hashiva said, I'll handle it. The next morning, he rings the doorbell, bright and early. Ooh, so he said, the, the, the student says, Rebbe, what are all this great uh, visits so early in the morning? He said, I've heard that you're too busy to take out your garbage. I'm here to take out your garbage. This is a true story. It was written in Mishpacha magazine a few years ago, so you know it's true. The Rosh Hashiva came to this Koilo guy, the uh, Ilyu. You couldn't stop learning. I hear you're too busy. You have no time to take out the garbage. So the Rosh Hashiva said, Pesach, I'm here to take out your garbage. Somebody has you hear? Somebody got to do it. Helping your wife. Derech Eretz Kodma La Torah. Derech Eretz Kodma La Torah. Many people forget that. What good is their learning if they forget their acheretz, kindness to your wife, Kadma la Torah, yes? When we first moved into our home, there was a big rabbi living next door. And every Friday, not only would take out the garbage, he was washing the floors. Uh huh. The Talmud says in Kiddushin, the greatest rabbis would work themselves making the cholin, making the gefilte fish, chopping wood for the oven. The greatest rabbis, why would they do that? To help their wives. The students said, we could do it for you, Shalom. Look at it in Tractate Kiddush and Perik Shani. The greatest rabbis with great students, they insisted on helping their wives personally. Chopping the wood. The rabbi has nothing better than chopping the wood. Those days you had no uh, microwaves. So he could have had a student do it. They would love to help the rabbi. They wouldn't let. I have to help my wife. Hmm? I remember my great Beb Rapam Zechat Sadiq Racha on Friday afternoon he would walk on Ocean Parkway with a, uh, with a carriage from Associated Supermarket so we say Rebbe we'll do the shopping for you he says no what do you mean you'll do it's a mitzvah for me to help my wife so the great rabbi on Friday afternoon he had nothing better to do thousands of Shilas he was pulled the wagon, the Agala. You know what the wagon, I have it here too, no? The wagon from Associated Supermarket on Ocean Parkway. He said, it's my mitzvah to help, to help my wife, not your mitzvah to help my wife. You know what the great rabbi said? He had nothing better to do with his time, Pesach. He set the example. That's why I made him a great rabbi. Bittle Torah! That's not Bittle Torah. What? Many people never today can't see the forest for the trees. Don't confuse me with the facts. Unfortunately. Right? But uh, interesting, right? Right? Mm. Yes? Go ahead. Go to a hotel. What? If you want shalom, buy it. 
Buy it? it what do you mean? Take out? What? Buy it. Oh, Shalom, buy, buy it. Oh. But sometimes a kind word expressing Akara Satoiv is more than buying a present, Rivka. A shmechel and expressing a kind word, I appreciate what you're doing for me. Huh? Do we remember to say that? Oh, what a delicious breakfast you made. I appreciate the effort you put in. Kind. That's right. There's a positive mitzvah to buy your wife what? Jewelry and clothing for Yom Tov. That's right. That's right. There's a positive mitzvah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We start off the the uh, the Haggadah Mitchila of the Vadazara Hayavatainu. All of our forefathers all worshipped idols. But now, despite that, despite that, God brought us close. Right? No matter how low a person is, he can always what? Do tshuva. Right? The Jews were a memtesh shalei tumah, and yet God redeemed us anyway. Right? Always read around, uh, around, around Pesach time, right? Now, it's interesting. Remember I said you can't ask the same Kasha's buddy every year. You mind if I go a little bit over time? This is important. This is very important. All the other Chagim, there's a mitzvah to blow the shoifer. Is there a mitzvah to talk about it? No. Just Nike, just do it. There's a mitzvah to shake a lul of an esrik. Is there a mitzvah to talk about it? No, just shake, shake, shake. The mitzvah to sit in the sukkah. Is the mitzvah to talk about it? Manishtana Pesach Mikol Achagim, where the Mishnah says that even though you ate Pesach Matz and Moror, if you didn't talk about it, it's like you ate Cheerios. I ate the three mitzvahs to eat Pesach Matz and Moror. If I ate Pesach Matz and Moror, but I didn't talk about it, it's like I ate Wheaties. Remember Wheaties, breakfast of champions? Why? Manishtana Pesach Mikola Chagim Avram. All the other Chagim, there's a mitzvah just do it. Sit in the sukkah. No mitzvah to talk about it. Shake a lulav. No mitzvah to talk about it. Pesach, Manishtana, where the mitzvah is, if you do the mitzvahs, it's zero, says the Mishnah, unless you what? Talk about it. What? But, okay, so you're begging the question. Why is the mitzvah to suffer about blowing a shoifer? Just blow it. Hey man, just blow it. What makes Pesach unique? So the Zohar Kodesh says something amazing. Pesach is an acronym. Acronym CIA, FBI. Pesach. The mouth speaks. Which is not true by any other, all the other Yom Tavim just do the mitzvah. Pesach, if you do the mitzvah, it doesn't count unless you also speak about it. The $64 question is why, Connie? What happened on Pesach night? You know, the Cinderella story comes from us. Pesach night, until midnight, we were what? Slaves. At the stroke of midnight, we became free. Yes, the stroke of midnight, we became free. What's the main difference, Nechama, between a slave and a free person? Remember Kunte, Kunte Kinte roots? A slave can't open up his mouth. You're going to talk in front of your master? A chamalia. Remember Kunte Kinte? A slave can't open his mouth, Connie. The clearest sign you're not a slave anymore, you can talk. Therefore, Pesach night is unique. Show God you appreciate your freedom. 
because as a slave you couldn't talk. Now that you're free, you can express yourself. So that demonstrates that we appreciate our freedom, which we didn't have until the stroke of midnight. So therefore, Pesach is unique, Manishtana Bikola Chagim, because Pesach night we became free. And the clearest sign of it between a free person and a slave is the power to talk about it, which you couldn't do as what? As a slave. So therefore, Pesach. And therefore, Rabbi Yaakov Meir made another great point based on the Sforno. The first mitzvah God gave us was the mitzvah to sanctify time. You would ask me, I would say, uh, I don't know, Shabbos, Hilchas Nida, Shatnis. Why is the first mitzvah given to a Jew where we were not even, we were still in Cairo? We, uh, it was seven weeks before the Torah was given. God couldn't wait. He gave us the mitzvah to sanctify time while we were still in Cairo. Why was that the first mitzvah that couldn't wait until what? Matan Torah, surely. So Sferno says, beautiful, who said that? A slave has no time. A slave's time doesn't belong to him. It belongs to Tutankhamun. A, a person has, a free person has time. Sanctify time. Show me you appreciate your freedom. Before you didn't have time. Time wasn't your own. It belonged to your master. Now that you're free, achodesh hazeh lochem. Demonstrate you appreciate your freedom, which is time, which you didn't have as what? You got to the bincha. Why is that so important? There are mitzvah to tell your kid about the sukkah and the lulav? No. You got to the bincha again. If you remember, kunte kinte and family trail. You remember that? A slave had no family life. Remember, I remember that. In 1976, I think. Slave had no family life. The kids were taken for him. We got to Labincha. Now you are able to relate to your children. As a slave, you couldn't do it. There was no parent-child relationship as a slave. Now you're not a slave anymore. You're free. Show me you appreciate that freedom. You once again have time. And once again, you have a parent-child relationship, which you didn't have until the stroke of midnight. Therefore, Pesach is what? Unique and different.